originally a talk on Reconstruction, and you know, he's made the point, Reconstruction lasted a lot longer than we thought. We usually say the 1876 political Reconstruction, but the Reconstruction of the South actually uh, was a lot longer than that. In some respects, it's never, it's never ended. Uh, we're still under it. And certainly the authors of, the, of our books that we're studying grew up uh, under the Reconstruction regime. Redeem it. We can't really understand what they were all about that unless you, you uh, understand where they were coming from. What, come, what growing up the South in the late 19th, early 20th century was all about. It is commonly understood that following Lincoln's assassination, President Andrew Johnson of Tennessee attempted to establish white supremacy throughout the South. He was thwarted only because congressional Republicans had the strength to override his vetoes. They advanced a plan to reunite the postbellum country as a more perfect union based upon racial equity combined with charity for former Confederates. After a noble start, their vision faded within a decade because stubborn white Southerners terrorized ex-slaves, regaining control of the state governments. Thereafter, the region remained impoverished due to the endemic racism and backwardness of her white people. Nevertheless, they lost the Civil War but won the Reconstruction. Almost all of that synopsis is erroneous or deceptive. First, although Andrew Johnson's racism was similar to that of many contemporaries, his policies were driven by his strict interpretation of the Constitution. When he was buried eight years after leaving office, his head was pillowed on a 50-year-old personal copy of the document. Thus, he believed the central government had only the powers enumerated in the Constitution and that all others were delegated to the states. When Lincoln died, and Robert E. Lee surrendered his Confederate army in April 1865, Congress was not scheduled to reconvene until December of that year. Therefore, President Johnson announced a reconstruction program that was modeled after Lincoln's wartime plan, albeit more demanding toward the planter class. Like Lincoln, Johnson argued that the southern states had constitutionally never been out of the Union and should be restored as functioning members as quickly as possible. He directed that most former Confederates who took his, his prescribed loyalty oath to the Union, including its new laws pertaining to slavery, be granted amnesty and voting rights. Wealthy planters, however, were required to apply directly to him for amnesty on a case-by-case -case basis. Voters enfranchised by Johnson's plan were to establish new southern state governments. By respecting the state's rights to govern themselves, the president's readmission terms were never static and never formal, but as events at the various state uh, constitutional conventions evolved, three goals became evident. First was a ban on slavery. All but Mississippi did so by ratifying or acquiescing to 
the 13th Amendment that outlawed slavery throughout America. It was the southern states under the governance of ex-Confederates who enabled the amendment to be ratified when Congress reconvened in December 1865. Without the southern states, that 13th Amendment would not have been ratified when the Congress reconvened. Mississippi banned slavery in its state constitution. It was the exception, but it did ban slavery in its state constitution. Second, the second goal was rejection of the secession ordinances. All states either repudiated or rescinded them. Third was, the third goal was cancellation of their wartime debts. Nobody who had loaned money to the Confederacy or a seceded state was to be repaid. All but Mississippi and South Carolina repudiated such debts, and the debts in those two exceptions were minor and enmeshed with other state finances. By comparison, for example, the debts of the Confederacy were 1.4 billion. The total sum of the state debts of the 11 states individually was only 67 million. Although Johnson would readmit the states on these terms, when the Republican-controlled Congress reconvened, it was clear that they would not. Nonetheless, the president, being respectful of the Constitution, he respected the right of Congress to set membership qualifications in their own body. Modern historians, academic particularly, as Dr. Wilson has pointed out, often condemn Johnson for failing to insist on black suffrage in the seceded states. But much like modern Democrats who argue today that the states had the authority to use mail-in ballots, uh, despite the fraud risk that it would run, Johnson reasoned that as president he lacked the authority. The Constitution did not give him the authority to interfere because it was a state's right to determine who was uh, to be a voter in the state or how the votes were to be or how the elections were to be run. Even though he personally favored gradual adoption of black suffrage, he realized that voter qualification had always been a state's right when Mississippi became the first state to organize a convention to set a new constitution, he urged that they grant uh, blacks the, who could read and write and owned at least $250 worth of property uh, to be granted the opportunity to vote. In October 1865, he explained to a former abolitionist who became a newspaper reported that, he, if, that if he were still Tennessee's governor, he would, quote, try and introduce uh, black suffrage gradually, first to military veterans and then to the literate and the taxpayers. His stance was really much like the only one that Abraham Lincoln ever voiced. The second reason the synopsis I started off with is, is erroneous is that the bulk of the evidence suggests that the postbellum Republicans promoted black civil rights and suffrage because they wanted the freedmen's votes, while only a minority really favored racial equality at that time. When the Civil War ended, the party, the, the Republican Party itself was only 10 years old. It might be strangled in its cradle if, it was re if the readmittance of the southern states was not managed in a way to keep the Republican Party in power. If they didn't manage it properly, the Northern Democrats would join with the Southern Democrats and the Republicans would lose their veto-proof control of the Senate. This table shows how the uh, membership in the House and the Senate would change if all 11 Confederate states re-entered as Democrats. So your number of, uh, instead of 39 Republicans to 11 uh, Democrats in the Senate, it would be 39 to 33. You know, no more veto-proof uh, ability there. Similar uh, uh, situation in the House but in the House, the Southern representation would increase because there would be, there would be no three-fifths limitation on the, uh, uh, the black votes or the black population. That's what this table shows. 
composition would have uh, would have have all former Confederate states sent Democrats to the S Senate and House would look like this. Understanding that the th ratification of the 13th Amendment would have added 12 new Southern representatives to Congress due to the negation of the three-fifths clause that I had just noted. In sum, Republicans would have lost their ability to override any of President Johnson's vetoes with this uh, pro forma uh, con congressional representation. Thus, the infant GOP solution required that most readmitted Southern senators and congressmen be Republicans. That meant vassal governments needed to be established in the region. However, since the Constitution requires that the states elect their own representatives, Republicans needed a way to limit the number of Senate Southern Democrat voters while simultaneously increasing the number of Republican voters. Since there were few white Republicans in the region, the party needed to create a new constituency. Consequently, they settled on two objectives. First was mandatory black suffrage in all former Confederate states, if not the northern states. They expected that such a mostly illiterate and inexperienced electorate could be manipulated to consistently re support Republican interest and to distrust their former masters. Second was to disfranchise, to take the vote away from the white classes most likely to oppose Republican government. The two goals were accomplished by the 1867 Reconstruction Acts passed over President Johnson's vetoes that paved the way for the 14th Amendment in 1868. The amendment had four key provisions. First, almost anyone born in America, especially the former slaves, would be a citizen and guaranteed civil rights. Second, states refusing suffrage to adult male citizens of any qualified race shall have their congressional representation cut by subtracting the number of members in the excluded race from the applicable state's population for purposes of calculating House representation and electoral votes. Because of the tiny black populations in the northern states, this provision was inconsequential for them. Third, many former Confederates were denied office holding privileges. The people that had been leaders through the war, the type of men that had demonstrated leadership, could, uh, many of them could not be elected to, uh, uh, to office. Fourth, notwithstanding that Congress considered the earlier Johnson-approved governments unlawful, all Southern states governed by them would be required to ratify the new amendment before they could be readmitted to the Union. In short, Congress was illegally using the amendment process to create new Republican regimes in the states of the uh, South. Among the states that ratified the amendment in time for the autumn elections were the Republican dominant electorates in Tennessee, Arkansas, Louisiana, Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, and Florida. All except Louisiana voted for Republican candidate Ulysses Grant in the ensuing 1868 election. In fact, Grant would have lost the popular vote without the 450,000 ex-slaves who voted for him. Thus, Grant was supported, he was supported only by a minority of white Americans, even in the North where he was a um, military hero. Even though also adding on to that, Texas, Virginia, and Mississippi were not, were not even permitted to vote at that time because they had not been readmitted under, congress, under congressional reconstruction. Finally, the carpetbag era Republican civil rights legislation focused on blacks because they were the solitary racial minority that could provide a large Republican loyal voting bloc. The party did nothing for other minorities such as Native Americans, Asian Americans, or Irish immigrants. 
America's biggest lynching occurred in 1873, which was during President Grant's administration. All 19 victims were Chinese, as were two-thirds of California's lynch victims between 1849 and 1902. Urged by Republican-controlled Western states, the federal government adopted a number of so-called Chinese exclusion acts that had the effect of blocking that race from voting or immigrating. Not until 1943, when some of the uh, uh, Chinese Americans were fighting in, with America's armies during World War II, not until then were Asian Americans even allowed to become naturalized citizens. Consequently, even as California's population tripled from 1880 to 1910, the number of Chinese Americans in the state actually declined. Third, while it is shamefully true that the Ku Klux Klan and other paramilitary organizations sometimes violently suppress Southern black and Republican voters, as noted in the synopsis, the underlying racism of their motives is overemphasized in modern memory by comparison to the misgovernment that resulted from Republican Reconstruction. The 14th Amendment made blacks the majority of voters uh, for the constitutional conventions in South Carolina, Mississippi, Louisiana, Florida, and Alabama. The carpetbag and scallywag regimes that gained control in states such as Arkansas and Tennessee after those state constitutions were voted in, those legislators disfranchised former Confederates, thereby putting the Republicans uh, and, the, and the black voters in charge in those states. Texas became a vassal government under the voter supervision of a Republican military commander as the state transitioned from martial to civil rule, and the situation in North Carolina was similar. A month after Appomattox, Union Major General William T. Sherman presciently wrote a colleague, quote, I have never heard a Negro ask for voting rights and I think it would be his ruin. I believe the whole idea of giving votes to the Negroes is to create just that many votes to be used by others for political purposes. Since about 90%, 95% of blacks were illiterate at the time and their white leaders had dubious motives, misgovernment became the rule. While each state had a variation of the same story We'll use South Carolina as an example. The year the carpetbaggers were kicked out of the state, an anonymous resident wrote an article for Atlantic Monthly in 1877. This is the same Atlantic magazine now that uh, uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates is a regular writer for. After the Republican state government was formed in 1868, he wrote, quote, then began those fantastic tricks which for six years made the government of South Carolina the worst mockery of the name ever seen on earth. In the legislature, in the legislature no bills could be passed without bribery, and, and by bribery, any bill whatever could be passed." Close quote. The state's bonded debt increased from $6 million to $34 million. The same writer for that article wrote, most of the money was raised on bonds deliberately, was deliberately stolen. Before the war, property taxes averaged $400,000 per year throughout the entire state. But, there, but in the years after the war, the property taxes were over $2 million a year, which was five times more. Notwithstanding a 73% drop in the assessed property values, taxes had increased fivefold. Quote, this is confiscation, pure and simple. To make matters worse, the fountains of justice were corrupted. Juries were composed chiefly of illiterate and degraded Negroes who thought their only duty was to find no bill or not guilty in all cases of blacks prosecuted by whites." Close quote. 
Daniel Chamberlain, who was a Massachusetts-born Yale graduate and the state's last carpetbag governor, authored another Atlantic Monthly article 34 years later in 1901. He affirmed that no well-informed political leaders should have expected Republican Reconstruction to succeed. Quote, in the mass of uh, colored voters in South Carolina in 1867, what forces could have existed that would make for good government? Ought it not have been clear that good government could not have been had for such an aggregation of ignorance, inexperience, and incapacity? Despite all the borrowings and spending, the state had not a single public improvement of any sort to show. Public offices were objects of bargain and sale. Justice in the courts was bought and sold. Although Chamberlain was truly appalled at the white military, paramilitary violence. He was not surprised. His remarks are, excer are excerpted and selectively edited as follows. Such <clears throat> misrule will lead to violence. It was brutal and murderous to the last degree, being in the hands of the lower stratum of the white population. Yet it was symptomatic of the gangrene, dishonesty, and corruption in public office. No excuse can be framed for its outrages, but its causes were plain. It flourished where corruption had climbed into power and withered where the reverse was the case. What is certain is that a people of force, pride, and intelligence, when driven to choose between temporary violence and permanent misrule, will infallibly choose the former." Close quote. In short, he concluded that the KKK and other paramilitary organizations were predictable counter-revolutions to the Republican Reconstruction misrule. It must be remembered, for example, that the carpetbag and scallywag regimes controlled the voting machinery in these states, thereby making it hard for them to lose at the polls. There was no way to defeat them at the polls. Although modern historians emphasize the progressive elements of such um, uh, 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 constitutions that the Republican regimes brought in, and they were progressive, what they overlook is that the, the uh, impoverished South had not the ability to pay for these things. Moreover, instead of promoting cooperation between the white and the black Southerners, the carpetbaggers essentially turned them against one another. The result was disastrous for blacks who could not readily leave the regions as could the Republican white leaders after the vassal regimes uh, collapsed. Wise blacks recognized the folly of trusting the carpetbaggers. In Up From Slavery, Booker T. Washington wrote, quote, though I, was little, uh, though I was but little more than a youth during Reconstruction, I had the feeling that the ignorance of my race was being used to help white men into office and that there was an element in the North which wanted to punish the Southern whites by forcing the Negro into positions over the head of Southern whites. I felt that the Negro would be the one to suffer for this in the end. Besides, the general political agitation drew the attention of our people away from the more fundamental matters of practical industry. Alan Guelza who is a uh, professor of history at Princeton University, is the one that coined the phrase, the South lost the war but won the Reconstruction. I sent him this photo. And I asked him to show me the winners. He did not respond. <laughs> the fourth deception in the synopsis is that the South lost the war but won the Reconstruction. And I've told you about the remark coming from Alan Guelzo. In, in reality, the longest lasting legacy of the Civil War has been Southern poverty 
not segregation and Jim Crow. Moreover, the region's protracted poverty, poverty did not result chiefly from the backwardness of her people, but from the victor's peace terms, which were shaped by economic priorities to, that enriched the North but impoverished the South. One example was the protective tariff. It was a powerful tool for enabling northern manufacturers to establish domestic monopolies by blocking imports. But it also encouraged European manufacturing economies to buy raw materials from countries other than America because it limited their ability to sell to us the imports that they would need to generate the dollars required to buy our exports. Since the South was an export-based economy, especially raw material exports, such consequences were injurious, injurious to the entire region. This is your uh, graph of exports. You can see here, what, sharply up, they went, <clears throat> they went sharply up at the start of the Civil War and they basically stayed high for 50 years. On the eve of the Civil War, tariffs on dutiable items averaged 19%, but increased to an average of 45% for 50 years thereafter. In 1861, the 11 state confederacy had more railroad mileage than any country in the world except the United States. Even though southern railroads badly needed rebuilding after the Civil War, railroad iron was priced at $80 a ton in New York as compared to $32 a ton in Liverpool. The differential was largely due to tariffs demanded by northern ironmakers. Even though Midwestern grain states might otherwise have supported free trade along with the South, the Republican Party held power by basically bribing Midwestern Union soldier veterans with generous pensions. The pensions, argued the GOP, required high tariffs. As the accompanying graph shows, postbellum tariffs did not drop until Southern-born Woodrow Wilson became president in 1913. When Republicans regained control of the uh, uh, government in the Roaring Twenties, tariff rates went right back up. They peaked at the start of the Great Depression with the Smoot-Hawley tariff, which only aggravated the weakness in worldwide trade during the 1930s. Only after the end of World War II, the end of World War II, when the economies of Europe and Asia had been wrecked, did America begin to promote free trade. And that is because the industries in the states north of the Ohio River and the Mason-Dixon Line realized after World War II that there was no competition for their products anywhere in the world. They wanted free trade. They wanted everybody to reduce their tariffs at that time because they realized they could become the, almost, the, the nearly the sole source of manufactured goods for the entire world. And it was a halcyon era for them from 1947 to 1967, but gradually the economies uh, in Asia and Europe recovered and the, uh, our uh, Rust Belt developed and became uh, non-competitive. The Republican Party generally controlled national politics from the start of the Civil War in 1861 to the bottom of the Great Depression, over 70 years. Each, each of the 12 states that joined the Union from the start of the war in 1861 to the end of the 19th century provided two new Republican senators for each one. So that would make a total of 24 new Republican senators coming from those 12 states. Not a single Democrat senator came from one of the new states until 1907, which was when Oklahoma joined the Union. Republicans transformed the South into an exploited internal colony, much like Great Britain had done with Ireland. Perhaps because of slavery, the region was the world's low-cost producer of cotton 
before the Civil War. It remained the world's low-cost producer long thereafter because the war had impoverished nearly all of her people. Southerners had been dumped into peonage, black and white. Most American cotton was exported well into the 20th century. Even right now, most of our cotton is exported. Even as late as the 1940s, farmers of both races, both races, uh, use, uh, worked under terms little different than the Russian serfs of the 19th century. Simultaneously, whites represented, this is 1940, whites represented half of the region's sharecroppers and two-thirds of her tenant farmers. In 1860, the South's per capita income was at the 72nd percentile of the national average. After the Civil War, it dropped to the 51st percentile, and it stayed there for at least 35 years. It did not return to its still below average 72nd percentile until 1950, which was 90 years later. As you can see, in the 1930s, there was little economic difference between white sharecroppers and black sharecroppers. There was a social difference. Surely the whites had the advantage of There's no denying that. But in terms of economics, they were nearly identical. The conqueror's version of black civil rights did not include having blacks live among northerners. In fact, the chief racial goal of the northern whites was to keep blacks out of the north. Since freedmen comprised a decisive Republican loyal voting bloc until the 1880 presidential election, the GOP wanted to keep them in the south. Simultaneously, northern workers did not want job-seeking blacks to cross the Ohio River or the Mason-Dixon Line. They were equally unwelcome in the West. Republican leader George Boutwell, who uh, later became Treasury Secretary under President Ulysses Grant, proposed to reserve the states of South Carolina and Florida exclusively for blacks, even if it meant forcing the other residents to relocate. Contrary to the misrepresentations of social activists, Jim Crow era Northerners were often at least as racist as Southerners. When a white boxer beat the aging black heavyweight champion Jack Johnson in 1915, a large outdoor crowd of Wall Street investment bankers was watching the results from a bulletin board that came from Telegraph results. When, the, when it was announced that Jess Willard, the white man, won this fight, the investment bankers pounded their unknown neighbors on the back and acted like gleeful school children." Close quote. In anticipation of about five years before this one, involving the great white hope, J James Jeffries, who lost, the New York Times wrote, in, as this bout was uh, uh, pending, quote, this is the New York Times, if the black man wins, thousands and thousands of his ignorant brothers will misinterpret his victory as justifying claims to much more than mere physical equality with their white neighbors." Close quote. These are shameful remarks. They are shameful whether they come from Southerners or Northerners. But this is the New York Times, and this is in 1915. The fourth deception of the synopsis is the omission of the reparations that ex-Confederates have already paid. During Reconstruction, former Confederates were required to pay their share of federal taxes for sizable budget items that if paid by an independent defeated foe would have constituted reparations. Although reparations are a common form of a victor's compensation, nobody should assume that the southern states escaped equivalent penalties merely because they were admitted to the Union. This table summarizes the federal tax revenues and spending for a quarter of a century after the Civil War had ended. More than half of the federal tax revenues were applied to three items. Number one, 
interest on the federal debt. Number two, budget surpluses used to retire the federal debt. Back in the days when they actually did that. <laughs> Number three, union veterans' pensions. Although compelled to pay their share of taxes required to fund these three items, former Confederates derived absolutely no benefit whatever from them. The budget surpluses repaid the federal war debts, which had jumped 40-fold from 65 million at the start of the war to 2.7 billion at the end. Southerners did not own any of those bonds. Some of them were held by the national banks, which bought them as monetary reserves, as mandated by the 1863 National Banking Act, but many were also owned by northern civilians. Bond policies also further penalized Southerners and other non-bondholders in another way. Specifically, in 1869 law, four years after the Civil War, required that all the bonds be redeemed in gold. Even though northern investors bought them during the war with paper money, which traded at a fluctuating discount to gold. During the war, the paper money got as low as 35 cents on the dollar for gold. So it's hard to say exactly how much the benefit was, but nonetheless, let me just continue. Since the bonds and interest had to be paid in gold, the value of the paper money required to make the payments was larger than the face amount of the bonds and their associated interest coupons. The difference was an extra cost to the taxpayer, but a bonus to the northern bondholder. Finally, former Confederates derived no benefit from the liberal federal spending on Union veterans' pensions. Such pensions were originally paid only to soldiers who received disabling injuries during the Civil War. But Republicans gradually expanded eligibility to solidify veterans as one of the party's voter constituencies. By 1904, any Union veteran age 62 or over was regarded as disabled, and that way they changed it from uh, a program for um, assistance of, for uh, injury to one of old age retirement. In 1893, the pensions alone represented 40% of the federal budget. Annual disbursements for these Union veterans' pensions did not peak until 1921, which was 56 years after the war had ended. The last Civil War monthly pension was paid five months ago in May 2020. In terms of our conference theme, the owners of America are those who control the culture. Unfortunately, the culture is controlled by media, which is increasingly distributed through the internet. Media determines literature. Literature shapes Hollywood. Presently, all of those sectors are dominated by people who are hostile to the Southern heritage, particularly Confederate heritage. The root cause is totalitarian academics, chiefly in the humanities courses such as history. One way to fight this is to stop donating to the Uramal Mater. <laughs>